Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Candidates. I'm joined here today with senatorial incumbent Rory Respicio for the Democratic ticket. Senator, welcome. Hafa uh, Rebecca. First of all, it's nice to meet you, and uh, I want to thank you and PNC for allowing me the opportunity to present myself as a senatorial candidate. Absolutely, absolutely. The first question is sort of a, a hot topic question. Um, it's in regards to deportation. Uh, Senator, what is your stand on the deportation of convicts by the current administration? Well, I've always supported the deportation of all foreign uh, habitual criminals. Um, my work in the legislature has made it so that I want the message to be clear that it's deportation of all foreign criminals and not just a select uh, group of individuals. I, you know, throughout the years I've served on the Association of Pacific Island Legislatures and I have a lot of respect for our Micronesian uh, brothers and sisters and, and those leaders. And my drive to want to implement the deportation efforts has really come from uh, those individuals. There's a lot of uh, Micronesians that, that support the deportation because they, they've migrated to Guam uh, under the Compact of Free Associations and they've made a not only a good life for themselves but a good life um, for and a good community for our entire island. Uh, they support deportation, Rebecca, because they don't want to get mixed in with those who come here and don't follow the law. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, I was very quick to uh, commend Governor Calvo and the administration. Ideally, deportation should be handled by the federal government. Okay. But absent that, uh, we see that Governor Calvo has made taken great strides to uh, do this and get the attention um, that is rightfully uh, deserved on this issue. And whether it's uh, deportation or commutation, there's provisions in there so that these individuals that have been sent back will not come to, uh, won't, won't come to Guam. There are safeguards in place. We see that the federal government has taken custody of two of those um, uh, individuals that were uh, deported back. So I think um, people just have to recognize that that any foreign individual who comes to Guam, doesn't play by the rules, doesn't follow the law, uh, will get uh, deported. Uh, President Obama has uh, touted that uh, his administration has deported about 70% of foreign individuals uh, coming into the United States, but, but those same numbers don't reflect uh, the federal government's commitment to this on Guam. So I'm going to continue to uh, do whatever is necessary to make sure that it's the deportation of all foreign criminals. I'm going to support Governor Calvo to make sure that it's the rule of law that uh, is applied in, in going forward with this uh, deportation uh, policy. But people also have to know that that um, migrant community uh, has an $8 million a year impact to the mm -hmm. Department of Corrections. So some people say, well, it's about a money issue. Well, that, but also it's about justice. It's about keeping our community safe, protecting our individuals from, from those who are habitual offenders. And so I, I would do whatever I can as a senator uh, to make sure that those principles apply. So do you agree with the uh, statement <clears throat> of the AG's office that the governor has no deportation powers? Well, the AG, uh, I've had conversations with General Barrett Anderson, and certainly she's expressed those uh, statements, but, but she's not saying that the governor should stop what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that the attorney general, as the chief legal officer, uh, it provides this kind of uh, legal guidance, and I, I'm also aware that there's been many conversations with the U.S. Attorney Alicia Lemtiaco. Mm -hmm. I think we're starting to see that the, because of Governor Calvo's actions, because of my actions over the years with respect to this issue, I think we're starting to see that the federal government needs to step in. Congresswoman Berdalio recently uh, wrote a letter to um, Esther Kayana, who's the mm -hmm. Assistant Secretary of the Interior, saying that the federal government needs to facilitate this process by way of a memorandum of understanding. But, but really it goes back to you know, our federal territorial relationship. And what I've been trying to do as a senator and what I've been successful at doing is creating the Guam First Commission where we speak with one voice okay. uh, in all matters relative to federal territorial policy. And, and so my strong leadership, uh, Rebecca, in the legislature has made it so that there, everything dealing with the federal government that we have to have a united one Guam approach and make sure that uh, messages are not diluted, make sure that any actions that the governor takes on behalf of the territory, recognizing that he is a governor of a territory, mm. we just have to support those kinds of initiatives. And, 
and uh, whatever whatever's happening now up until this point, we're seeing that that the deportation effort is getting the attention it deserves, and and sending a strong signal to all members of the community that if you don't play by the rules, if you don't follow the law, uh, as a foreign individual coming to Guam, regardless of how you came to Guam, uh, you will be deported if you don't follow the law. Okay, wonderful. Moving on um, to minimum wage mm -hmm. pay increase. Uh, would you support another minimum wage increase? Yes or no and why? Well, yes, in the, but it's got to be based on some actual experiences. I, I have oversight of labor in the legislature, mm -hmm. and most recently uh, Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz's bill to raise the minimum wage made it on the session agenda. Mm -hmm. But after talking to the Vice Speaker, he, he was extremely reasonable to make a motion just yesterday to have that bill go back to my committee. Because when I held a hearing on the minimum wage bill, uh, Rebecca, the, the consensus was when the minimum wage was raised by a dollar, the vice speaker and all of us, we agreed to support Senator Yamashita's bill that said a study is first required to mm -hmm. determine the impact before the raise is made. That public hearing, many people said, why don't we just wait for the study? And so mm -hmm. from that hearing, which was months ago, to having the bill on the agenda, I didn't think it was fair for, for the community, for, for the stakeholders of this, this issue, uh, to see that they went from a public hearing to session uh, without regrouping to recognize that the vice speaker wants to move forward with or without this study and I'm committed to holding several roundtable hearings from now until the October session to bring everybody back in to to have the legislature hear things like when the minimum wage was first raised by a dollar uh, employees received reduced hours they're saying that if the minimum wage is to be raised again that they're gonna go from reduced hours to no job at all because mm -hmm. that's how they're gonna have to deal with the impact we need to hear those things and we need to uh, recognize that in, along with dealing with the minimum wage increase, there's also the um, tip wages. Mm -hmm. So that when the minimum wage was increased by a dollar, businesses can no longer and should no longer apply that 10% service charge to offset the, um, the, the individual's uh, minimum wage salary. So I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to um, strengthen that, to, to move forward on those discussions, and I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to, to what the next 30 days will result. Okay, wonderful. And along the same lines of speaking of wage increase, senatorial pay raises, um, can you give us your opinion, perhaps, on the controversial senatorial pay raises? You're asking great questions, and uh, I know you're new to the island, and you're six days on the job with PNC. Congratulations. Uh, the issue of senatorial pay raises, I've mm -hmm. always, always supported to cut my salary. I've never defended my senatorial salary. I never uh, said that to my colleagues that this is a salary that I received and so I should uh, keep it. My first term in the legislature, I was able to reduce senator salaries uh, down to $40,000, uh, which was uh, $1,100 a month wow. cut for nine months because all of the classified employees went to a 30-hour work week. So the record is clear that I'm the only senator to cut senatorial salaries. Now with respect to how the senator's salaries were raised through the Competitive Wage Act, I finally voted for the rollback and I finally uh, voted for the override because the Department of Administration admitted that there was a cash crunch. And so that matter is currently um, remains before the legislature. Uh, the whole issue of senatorial pay raises, I. The record is clear. I've not only reduced my salary as a senator, but I've also always voted in every instance uh, to roll the salary back. Okay, thank you so much, Senator, for joining us today on this episode of Coffee with the Candidate. Is there anything else you would like to share, perhaps? Well, I'm here to uh, ask the community to uh, send me back to the legislature to please continue to vote for me. I, 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 work, I will work with anyone. I'm very uh, committed to my work as a senator. Uh, I've done things like creating the Recycling Revolving Fund mm -hmm. to provide for recycling initiatives. I was able, with the help of my colleagues, to fund the Zero Waste Program to extend the life of the landfill. As I mentioned earlier, I created the Guam First Commission so that we could speak with uh, one voice. I've also uh, introduced a bill to increase the threshold for the Dave Santos um, Act so that businesses who are making $50,000 now get a $40,000 exemption. My bill will take it up to $150,000 as a threshold so that more people will qualify for this tax break. 
I've also uh, supported the Biosecurities Division at the Department of Agriculture to provide for um, programs for the invasive species and the rhino beetle in particular. But more importantly, people who know me know I work hard. People who know me know that I value my role as a senator, my job as a senator. I'm a grandson of civil servants. My grandmother uh, worked really hard with, the, with my grandfather. They retired from the government. And after that, my grandmother, uh, Tendek Respicio Kakaroti Rivera family from Dedido. She uh, spent eight years with Governor Joseph Atta's administration by serving on the Airport Authority Board. My dad, Robert Respicio, retired from the Guam Power Authority. My mom, Rose Manley Respicio, retired from the Guam Telephone Authority. And so I, you know, I, I, I bring up my family um, work experience to let people really know that this is a tough job. And if you know my essence, my core, if you know how I grew up and where I came from, then it'll explain a lot why I still want to continue to serve in the legislature uh, despite the kind of environment that's deteriorated so much so where we are seeing the politics of personal destruction come back and there's no room for that on our island. There's no room for that in our legislature. There's no room for that in our legislative process. And, and I've never made any unilateral decisions. I don't decide things on my own. I do chair the Committee on Rules. And even at that, the body decides what goes on the agenda. The body decides what doesn't go on the agenda. I also have oversight over the Haganya redevelopment. And I'm very proud in my work with the Calvo administration to revitalize Haganya. And so my record's very clear. And I know it's a very short time to talk <laughs> about it, but just, just but give me a chance and absolutely. please vote for me and send me back to the legislature. Thank you so much. You. Um, we'll be right back with Coffee with the Candidates. Thank you. Welcome back to Coffee with the Candidates. I'm joined now with Senatorial hopeful Therese Terlaki for the Democratic ticket. Um, Therese, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Of course. Um, we're going to get right into it. The first question is sort of a hot topic issue, deportation. Um, what is your stand on the deportation convicts by the current administration? Well, I think there are several issues involved here. One is, of course, it's um, what is our response to crime on Guam? And I think people of Guam are, you know, absolutely fed up with crime. I myself, you know, my home was broken into maybe three times and one of them with the children in it. And I just think no one on Guam should have to stand for that. So we do need to take care of crime on Guam. I think, um, uh, when it comes to commutation of sentences, we need to be very careful and, what the, and we need to come up with a policy on whose sentences get commuted. I mean, what if uh, other people in DOC want the same treatment and want to be sent someplace in exchange for, you know, com mm -hmm. commuting their sentences, commutating their sentences. And, um, and I just think, and the bigger picture really is that the people of Guam, you know, of course, they're, they are feeling the impacts of U.S. policy here. Uh, restrictions that we have for our eco economic growth, they're feeling the impacts of you know, migration that the United States negotiated with other nations, they're feeling the impacts of U.S. You know, activity here. And I just think naturally, yeah, the people of Guam, they, are, they need the U.S. to address these things. They need to address these things also ourselves. And so I think that all of our leaders really, really need to put their focus back and really get the United States to either take care of you know, policy, the impact to Guam, mm -hmm. or take care of the migration policy itself, or take, you know, allow Guam to establish its own, you know, by self-determination, its own immigration policy. And uh, to, you know, to take care of all those federal issues, the, the, our ability to sustain our own e economy. And, uh, so I think we need to focus you know, our efforts on that. We need to make sure that our relationship with other neighboring governments also, you know, that 
that it's what we want, that you know, we need these governments, or we should be able to look to our neighboring governments who have had self-determination in our pursuit of self-determination so that they you know, can vote with us when it comes time at the United Nations, so that they can, when they negotiate with the United States, negotiate to take care of Guam in their compacts with the United States, you know, and uh, the impacts to Guam. And so, yeah, I think that, yeah, but the, the bottom line is crime. And yes, definitely yes. We, need, we need to, you know, focus all our efforts on preventing crime. The whole national trend is preventing, you know, crime in the youth. And uh, they, they've shifted, you know, even their finances so that that's where they put their money so that we don't have to fund prisons, you know, as much as we did before. And uh, I think the government of Guam has to absolutely get, get on top of that. So um, do you support or do you agree with the statement of the AG's office of, of the governor that the governor has no deportation powers? Well, they, I think they are, they've clearly pointed out that, you know, the, fed, the federal enforcing the mm -hmm. deportation is going to be relying on the federal government. You know, mm -hmm. they are the ones controlling our immigration right now. And, and so, like I said, it's either we get in there and we control our own immigration through our self-determination or we've got to, you know, rely on the federal government to control immigration to Guam or migration to Guam. And, and uh, I think, yeah, we just have to make sure that our commutation policy is really what the people of Guam want. That it's not random, it's not race-based, and it's it's what, you know, what we want. What oh, okay, absolutely. Moving on to um, minimum wage pay increase, would you support um, another minimum wage increase if you were elected as senator? I would. I think that the proposals that are now, you know, the, the, the amounts that are now being proposed are in line with really, you know, a nationwide trend of getting people who are actually working mm -hmm. to a level that they can take care of themselves and their family. And mm -hmm. it's really just this, we are here, we exist as a government to take care of, make sure people can get out of poverty, you know, to take, to, that's, to better serve them. And uh, if, yeah, Raising the minimum wage will get them to, and their children, and you know, and we've seen, you know, all studies will show you the long-term effects of getting children out of poverty, getting families who are working to stay working and to contribute to the government in that way, then yes, I support that. And I think the government, you know, has to support small businesses, and it does support small businesses, and I think it just needs to continue and finesse its policy and how it will f support small businesses so that small businesses in turn can continue to, to employ. And moving on to or along the same lines of wage increase, um, senatorial pay raises. Could you give us your opinion on the sort of somewhat controversial senatorial pay raise? Yes, it's very, um, I, I have to say, you know, going out while I'm campaigning, I've heard so much from people of Guam on this issue. and. Uh, and I think they are justifiably concerned about the government and what they see as luxurious spending by the government when the government in turn, you know, and just this summer we've seen proposes to raise, you know, the costs for hospital fees, the fees, you know, utility rates, they propose to raise solid waste rates, they propose port rate increases, and they propose tax increases, all kinds of tax increases. And I think the people seeing this and then, you know, these things being placed on their backs or proposed to be placed on their backs in the face of luxurious spending. So they see that as luxurious spending and they see, you know, there are many government agencies that gave themselves raises, especially the autonomous ones, that the people did not have input into. They did not get a say in that. And I think that's their other frustration. And I, and I think it's justified that, you know, they want to be heard and I think they deserve to be heard. So would be it by referendum or, you know, a vote or by uh, petition or whatever means that they want to be heard, that they should be, be heard. They deserve to be heard on all of these luxurious spending, illegal raises, illegal spending, spending that's not even accounted for in our budget. They should be heard on all of those items and uh, those should really, really be, you know, brought to the table and, and uh, attention of the legislature brought to those. So, so do you think the, or should the people rather be given the right to repeal the current salary via means of plebiscite? Uh, plebiscite, sure. If they, if they are able to do that, I, I support that. Oh, oh and why? Uh, because it's, it's, plebiscite is one way for the people to directly speak. And this is their government, and they need to have that 
petitions another way and all these ways coming to the legislature and let us act you know the legislature act for you that's another way and so these are all legitimate ways for the people to act and it's their government and I totally think the government of Guam will do better by opening itself up for involvement by the people absolutely and moving on to um, the next topic child sex abuse um, what is your opinion of how the church is handling the sexual abuse cases being filed? Well, we know that yesterday the, the legislature passed a bill to address child sexual abuse and that they lift the statute of limits. So mm -hmm. this is open now for uh, anyone who's been a victim to come forward. And I, and I think that's good. And I hope that this policy will ensure that victims are taken care of. And I'm sure the courts will. I mean, you know, now that cases have been filed, that, that, that the church will have to respond. And anyone who's been, you know, um, alleged to be the perpetrators will have to respond. And that uh, victims, hopefully, you know, now will have their day in court. And, and that the courts will ensure that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So do you agree on allowing civil litigation on past child sex abuse cases? I know that you said that the Silent No More case had just been held, but... No, that they passed the bill to allow bill. that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, it's going to the governor now, and we'll see if it becomes law, but yes, I support that, that effort that, that raised the statute of limits, yes. Okay, and moving on to the next subject of medicinal or recreational marijuana, are you for or against the implementation of medical marijuana, and why? Um, this was, again, something decided by the people. They decided for medicinal marijuana, and I, we all, you know, I think every family in Guam is affected by cancer. Mm -hmm. If it's not us directly, it's, it's our family, and I, no one's spared. And I just think if medicinal marijuana, and they've shown this, that it can really help people who are suffering from cancer and other illnesses. Uh, but cancer is the one that really strikes home for me. And it's like, if, if this is going to help them when they are suffering, why would I want to watch my loved ones suffer? Absolutely not. And if it, there's a way for this to cure them, then by all means, you know, I think that's what medicine does. It explores all avenues of, of how to cure, how to ease suffering. And I just think it's, it's yes, the people of Guam, we should find ways to make this very accessible, to make it affordable, to make it so that you know the government of Guam benefits from any profit that might be made off of it, so that the government of Guam can in turn regulate it properly, and the government of Guam can, uh, you know, um, enforce what might need to be enforced. Okay, absolutely. And those are all the questions I have for you today. Is there anything you would like to share? Um, maybe. Oh well. Um, I just would like maybe just to ask every, you know the people of Guam to help me to support me, and uh, I want to tell them why I'm running for government. I'm mean, running for senator, if I may. It's uh, you know I I I'm a mother. I'm a mother of three daughters, and I am a professor at the University of Guam for many years. I've been working with the criminal justice public admin students, and I've seen how this generation looks at Guam. And I'm very concerned at whether they see opportunity on Guam, whether they think Guam um, is a place where they would want to raise their family. And I'm very concerned when they turn around, they see suffering on Guam. We all see this. We see families suffering just to take care of each other, get them health care, get them you know, to school, that type of thing. So um, I've, you know, since I graduated from UCLA Law School, I've been working as a lawyer and working with families who are in need. I've been working with small businesses, trying to find them solutions you know, so they could continue. And I've been working with the government, helping the government to find ways to better serve the people of Guam. And, and I really think the government can better serve, and I think the legislature plays a critical role in this. The legislature has this special power of, you know, one of the checks and balances of the government is the legislature, and it's really been the last resort for the people of Guam. And as a place where the people can be heard, they should be heard and it's a place where the people um, can get the government to shift and get the government to really address the needs of the people and to serve the people. And, um, and so that's what I bring and I bring all my experience and uh, as a, you know, my personal experience as a parent, experience, work, my dedication and commitment to solving problems. And I've been working for the people of Guam all my life. And I, I, I think I can serve them well as a policymaker and in that checks and balance role. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And that concludes uh, this episode of Coffee with the Candidates. Join us next week for another episode of Coffee with the Candidates.